Good evening and welcome to News Night. Tonight we'll have all your international, national, and local news. I'm Devin Ami. And I'm Juliana Brock. We have all the details about the miraculous survival of two pilots after a plane crash in Australia. Plus, stay tuned to hear about the multiple natural disasters that have been quaking all around the world. All this and more coming up on News Night. by UCLA researchers proves that pharmacies in tourist areas of northern Mexico are selling fake pills containing heroin, methamphetamine, and fentanyl. The pills, which were sold to tourists from the United States, were disguised as controlled substances like oxycodone, Percocet, and Adderall. According to U.S.-based researchers, this could raise the already high number of overdose deaths caused by these drugs in the United States and Mexico. According to UPI, the researchers discovered that the controlled substances were available for purchase without a prescription in 68% of the 40 pharmacies that they examined. The pills were available for purchase individually or in bottles. From 11 pharmacies, the investigators discovered counterfeit pills containing heroin, methamphetamine, and fentanyl. Methamphetamine was found in 9 Adderall pill samples, fentanyl in 8 oxycodone pill samples, and 3 of the oxycodone samples also contained heroin. Chelsea Shover, senior study author, stated, quote, These counterfeit pills represent a serious overdose risk to buyers who think that they're getting a known quality of a weaker drug, end quote. Two pilots were able to walk away from a jet crash in Perth, Australia, while fighting wildfires late Monday evening. According to ABC News, the two men who are believed to be Canadian citizens were flying a Boeing 737 jet converted for firefighting when it crashed in the Fitzgerald River National Park in southern western Australia state. The plane went down shortly after dumping loads of water on wildfires with additives and turbulent conditions. Despite the plane becoming engulfed in flames and smoke upon impact, the pilots walked away with only minor injuries. Luckily, they were both released from the hospital on Tuesday. The two-engine tanker is owned by a Canadian-based company called Coulson Aviation. A crash occurred in 2020 when, an a, when a C-130 Hercules tanker went down in the east coast state of New South Wales, killing three aviators. Crash investigator Angus Mitchell started, that, started to say that it was too early to make any connections between the two Coulson Aviation accidents. Monday's crash was the first serious one involving a Boeing 737 jet. Colson Aviation is sending executives to Sydney, Australia. Mitchell added, quote, In terms of a large aircraft like this coming down, it's generally never one thing that goes wrong. It's quite often a succession of things, end quote. Emergency Services Minister Stephen Dawson told ABC reporters, It's nothing short of miraculous that they were able mm. to walk away from that plane. The Middle East is reeling this week after a series of earthquakes devastated parts of the region. Reporter Colleen Winder has more on how it affected areas are recovering. A devastating earthquake struck Turkey in northern Syria this Monday, killing and injuring thousands in its wake. Monday morning, a quake hit near the city of Gaziantep, Turkey, coming in with 7.8 magnitude with a depth of 11 miles. A second quake followed in the Izbitistan district of Karamanmarash province of Turkey with a 7.5 magnitude, the most powerful earthquake in the region's century. As of now, there have been 4,300 deaths and thousands injured and displaced due to the overwhelming destruction of many buildings and homes. Currently, rescue efforts are in full effect as countries around the world send their support to locate survivors and protect the displaced families that are now suffering from the below freezing weather and rainstorms plaguing the area. This is especially concerning to the northern Syrians affected as they are still suffering from a previous war conditions that have depleted their economy and infrastructure, leaving these populations vulnerable to fatalities. According to CNN, UNICEF is working with the Turkish government to address, quote, emerging needs linked to the wider humanitarian response, end quote. The situation is ongoing with sites like CNN and BBC giving live updates on the disaster relief and death tolls. If you're interested in donating to the relief efforts, consider visiting the Syrian American Medical Society, Turkish Red Crescent, and more online. Tensions between the U.S. and China were at the forefront last week when a Chinese balloon made its way into American airspace. Newsnight reporter Brennan McNamara has more. Thanks, Devin. A massive surveillance balloon was discovered last week flying over the United States. The balloon, which was the size of three buses, flew at over 60,000 feet and is believed to have been from China. 
It first entered U.S. airspace on January 28th in Alaska and then flew southeast into Canadian airspace over the Northwest Territories on January 30th. By January 31st, the balloon had re-entered American airspace over northern Idaho. On February 1st, the balloon was confirmed to be over Reed Point, Montana. Two hours later that day, the balloon was then spotted east of Reed Point in Billings. From there, the balloon flew over South Dakota, Nebraska, and Missouri before ending up in North Carolina on Saturday morning. The balloon reached South Carolina by Saturday afternoon, where its voyage came to an abrupt end when an F-22 fighter jet shot it down over territorial waters, roughly six nautical miles from the coast. The Chinese government admitted that the balloon had originated in China, however they deny it was for spying purposes, claiming instead that it, was used, that it was a civilian craft used for weather and other scientific research. The FBI is expected to take custody of any recovered components of the balloon to conduct analyses and intelligence gathering. Tunisian President Kas Saied extends their eight-year state of emergency, which will now end in December of this year. Late last year, Saeed stated that the state of emergency will end as of January 31st of 2023. However, he has now extended it once again. The state of emergency started on November 24th of 2015 due to the increasing amount of terrorism, citing a suicide attack in the country's capital, Tunis, that killed 12 presidential guards. With this long stretch of time, many, including the UN's Human Rights Committee, have concerns. The committee points out that, quote, the draft bill relating to attacks on armed forces would foster the culture of impunity that prevailed in the security and armed forces and allow prosecution of any journalist or human rights defender who criticized the actions of the security forces, end quote. They now urge them to make their bills to fight terrorism anchored to human rights protection rather than targeting activists and political opponents. The UN now assures, quote, the committee's concludes, concluding observations and recommendations on the report of Tunisia will be issued at the end of the session on the 27th of March, end quote. The U.S. and Philippines military confirmed a deal last week to counter China's growing regional influence in Southeast Asia. The deal includes allowing U.S. forces to occupy four new bases in the Philippines. This occupation will complete a U.S. military goal to encircle Chinese territories with U.S. bases held in South Korea, Japan, and now the Philippines. While the Filipino government has been weary to increase the U.S. military footprint in the past, the countries in tandem agreed that the threat of Chinese military presence needed a swift response. This ratified by Kenneth Falvmantoya, an expert on Filipino politics from Santa Clara University, who said, quote, By itself, the Philippines cannot stand up to China, so it does need the assistance of the United States. So from the U.S. and the Philippine perspective, it appears to be a win-win situation, end quote. Coming up, a derailed train in Ohio has led to closed schools and evacuated towns. How is the state working to keep the residents safe? And Sunday night's Grammy Awards came with some surprise wins, an all-new time record. Find out who took home the most awards after the break. Regular physical activity is one of the most important things you can do for your health. The benefits of physical activity include brain health, weight management, reducing disease, strengthening your bones and muscles, and improving your ability to do everyday activities. So, it's time to get up and be active.
planned joint suicide has recently been discovered in York County. The event took place in West Manchester Township. The three victims have been identified by the coroner as the Dobb family, married couple James and Deborah Dobb and their 26-year-old daughter Morgan. A series of letters were left behind by all members of the family, including some that date back over nine months. According to the letters, the family decided to commit suicide as a whole after Morgan expressed her wishes to do so herself. The original plan was for Morgan and Deborah to commit together and leave James behind. However, once hearing of this plan, he decided that he wanted to be a part of it. Many of the documents contain religious themes as the family was devout Christians. One of the main statements was the choosing of their date of death, which Morgan picked based on a Bible verse. Other notes are from the day of the suicide, with writings about dying in the hands of each other and the arms of one another. Morgan did not leave any notes this day, which determined that she had killed herself. The deaths of James and Deborah were deemed as homicide, whereas Morgan's death was considered a suicide. All three suffered gunshot wounds to the head and were found lying in a straight line. The family left one last note with instructions for their family on how to care for their dog, which they also left behind. The event shook the entire community as many knew them to be a very quiet family despite their religious views and beliefs. The investigation is still ongoing with more info to come. A middle school and its food vendor had to apologize after serving a culturally inappropriate lunch on the first day of Black History Month. Nyack Middle School in Rockland County, New York, along with its food vendor, Aramark, upset many students and families after serving chicken and waffles along with watermelon for lunch on February 1st. David A. Johnson, the principal of Nyack, wrote in a letter to parents that the menu offered was, quote, inexcusably insensitive and reflected a lack of understanding of our district's vision to address racial bias, end quote. Johnson claims the lunch menu was changed from what it was originally planned to be on February 1st. The original schedule posted on the school's website shows Aramark planned to serve Philly cheesesteak, broccoli, and fresh fruit for lunch. According to CNN, this is not Aramark's first strike, as they've been previously called out for serving an offensive menu at New York University back in 2018. In that incident, two employees were fired and NYU discontinued their contract with Aramark after they served, quote, ribs, collard greens, cornbread, smashed yams, mac and cheese, and two beverages, red Kool-Aid and watermelon-flavored water during Black History Month. Parents have been calling to try and dismiss Nyack's contract with Aramark. School officials, nor the vendor company, mentioned why the lunch menu was changed. Aramark released a statement regarding the situation at Nyack Middle School, stating, quote, We apologize for the unintentional insensitivity shown on February 1st, the first day of Black History Month. While our menu was not intended as a cultural meal, we acknowledge that the timing was inappropriate and our team should have been more thoughtful in its service, end quote. Last Sunday, the biggest names in music descended on Los Angeles for this year's Grammy Awards. Reporter Colleon Winder has the details on who took home a golden gramophone. The 65th annual Grammy Awards just passed, leaving some surprising and well-deserved awards given to many amazing music artists. The event was held in Los Angeles at the Crypto.com Arena on February 5th, hosted by comedian Trevor Noah. During the function, we saw many performances from big-time artists like Bad Bunny, Harry Styles, Mary J. Blige, Steve Lacey, Lizzo, and more. The Grammys also celebrated the 50th anniversary of hip-hop with performances from the genre's biggest stars like Missy Elliott, Lil Wayne, LL Cool J, who then allotted Dr. Dre a 2023 Global Impact Award. Now, here are some of the most notable winners in categories of the night. Best Song of the Year was given to Bonnie Wright for their song, Just Like That. Best Album was given to Harry Styles for his album, Harry's House. Best New Artist was given to Samara Joy. Best Record was given to Lizzo for her song, About Damn Time. Best Pop Duo was given to Sam Smith and Kim Petras for their song, Unholy. And Best Dance Recording given to Beyonce for her song, Break My Soul. Making Beyonce the most awarded artist in Grammy history with 32 wins throughout the years. Congratulations to these Grammy winners. The grizzly bear's protections as an endangered species may be coming to an end. Reporter Brendan McNamara has more on what this may mean for hunters in the north. Thanks, Devin. The Biden administration is considering ending federal protections for grizzly bears in the northern Rocky Mountains, which would open the door to future hunting in Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. The United States Fish and Wildlife Service said that officials from these states provided substantial evidence that the grizzly bear population has recovered from the threat of extinction. Federal officials, however, rejected a claim by Idaho that protections should be lifted nationwide. 
They also raised concerns that these Republican-led states were passing new laws that could harm the grizzly bear population. There will be at least one year of further study before any final decisions will be made. However, state officials insisted that any future hunts would be restricted and would not affect the overall population. In recent years, however, Republican lawmakers in these states have passed more aggressive policies against gray wolves, which include loosened trapping regulations that could lead to grizzly bears being killed accidentally. The western half of the United States once saw nearly 50,000 grizzlies living there. However, they were exterminated over the last century due to hunting and trapping. Now there are little, little more than 2,000 bears living in the lower 48, while much larger numbers exist in Alaska, where hunting them is legal. Montana Governor Greg Gianfort welcomed this announcement and said that the grizzly bear's recovery, quote, represents a conservation success. Crews in Ohio are preparing a controlled release of the chemicals in a train, carrying hazardous material that derailed this past Friday. East Palestinian officials ordered the relocation of all residents in the area, anyone within one mile of the site. Sheriffs went door to door in the affected radius, alerting residents to evacuate quickly and efficiently. Schools, offices, and businesses were closed the following Monday, and a shelter in place order was put into effect on the whole town of East Palestine, home to about 5,000 people. Governor Mike DeWine emphasized that the importance of the evacuation, saying that this past Sunday, quote, a drastic temperature change has taken place in a rail car, and there is now a potential of a catastrophic tanker failure, which could cause an explosion with a potential of deadly shrapnel traveling up to one mile, end quote. Two evacuation stations were built as shelters for any evacuees with nowhere to go. Buffalo, New York had a scare this past Monday when residents experienced a 3.8 magnitude earthquake, the strongest earthquake in the past 40 years. The record-breaking quake began at 6.15 a.m. east of Buffalo in West Seneca. Emergency service officials in the county confirmed that the earthquake was felt in a 30-mile radius of the center, including 20 miles north of Buffalo in Niagara Falls. Residents reported the shakes rattling their windows and door frames, but luckily no other damages were reported in the affected areas. Erie County Executive Mark Pullingkars tweeted shortly after the event, quote, it felt like a car hit my house in Buffalo. I jumped out of bed, end quote. The exact cause of the quake is still unknown. After the break, we'll have more on the recently closed Charles Anderson Memorial Bridge, and bus detours will be making it harder for Millville residents to get around. We'll be right back. The Charles Anderson Memorial Bridge will immediately close in Pittsburgh for renovations for at least four months. Boulevard of the Allies traffic crosses Junction Hollow and connects Central and South Oakland with Shenley Park and Squirrel Hill on this bridge. 
Pittsburgh Department of Mobility and Infrastructure predicts that these repairs will take no, long, no less than four months, even though they intend to reopen the bridge as soon as possible. The estimated cost of the work is between one and two million dollars. Both bicycles and pedestrians will still be able to cross the bridge, however, it will be unaccessible for traffic. The bridge's lower third level junction hollow trail will also continue to be accessible. Mayor Ed Ganey commented, quote, I made a pledge to the residents of Pittsburgh that I will not hesitate to close a bridge for the safety of our citizens. Inspection results have come back that tell us that this bridge needs repair work to be safe for traffic. It's because of the safety systems that we've put in place over the last year that we can act immediately and proactively to close this bridge, preventing another fern hollow, end quote. According to WTAE, there are detours to take which are recommended by the city and can be found online. An arrest warrant has been issued for 26-year-old James Warren Hudson Jr. Hudson is accused of stabbing a man in the neck with a pair of scissors. The incident went down on Monday evening at a home in Zephyr Avenue in Sheridan. According to the criminal complaint, a witness told police that the victim and Hudson had gotten into an argument prior to the violence. Hudson fled the scene and the victim was taken to the hospital in critical condition where he underwent surgery. A canine officer picked up the scent around the back of the victim's house where he found the pair of scissors used to stab the victim lying on the sidewalk. According to WPXI, Hudson is being charged with attempted criminal homicide and aggravated assault and has not been taken into custody yet. A 135-year-old mansion located in Pittsburgh's north side Pittsburgh is on the market. According to the Tribune Review, the historic Russell H. Boggs mansion that was constructed in 1888 is built with stone in its original slate roof, holding with it eight guest rooms, nine bathrooms, and a ballroom. But it would not be a historical mansion without a ghost. Legend has it there have been sightings of a shadow traveling up and down the spiral staircase. Current owners Jeff Stasco and Carl Cargill told the Trib about rumors regarding a coffin located in the sub-basement, which had been closed off. The rumor says that in the coffin lies a little boy who was beaten to death in the ballroom by his father and Mr. Boggs for breaking a valuable item belonging to Boggs. The coffin was hidden in the sub-basement to keep outsiders unaware of the boy's death. If you do not mind these eerie rumors and would like to be the new owner of the Boggs Mansion, it is on the market for $2.5 million. Citizens of Millville who are frequent users of Pittsburgh Regional Transit may face inconveniences as routes in that area are being forced to detour. This comes after deterioration of the Grant Avenue Bridge was found last week and the bridge's weight limit was lowered to six tons. A spokesperson from PRT says that the limit is significantly lower than some of their smallest buses. PRT told the Post-Gazette that the two Mount Royal buses would normally be redirected to Lincoln Avenue, but the avenue is closed. Therefore, the detour will travel along Evergreen Road, where PRT will add six new bus stops. However, seven other stops will be discontinued, which is expected to affect the average of 30 riders. There is no official date as to when repairs will be made to the Grant Avenue Bridge. More details regarding the detours can be found at RidePRT.org. After the break, weather reporter Ashton Harder is here with our Newsnight weather forecast, which might just give us some hope for spring. We'll be right back. Good evening and welcome to News Night. My name is Craig Burkowski. Tonight, we'll cover all your international, national, and local news. Australia is one of the most biodiverse countries on the planet. Over 8,000 items are to be auctioned off at Pittsburgh International Airport on October 22nd. Last Thursday, the House Committee investigating the January 6th attack chose to subpoena former President Donald Trump. All this and more coming, coming up, up on, on News Night. Night.
Last month, the Yale University School of Public Health held a ceremony to honor nine-year-old Bobby Wilson for her efforts in curbing the spread of the invasive spotted lanternfly, NPR reports. The budding science lover's story went viral after her neighbor, a former town council member, called the police to report her while she was collecting specimens in her hometown. In October, Bobby was inspired to participate in the New Jersey's Stomp It Out campaign, which urged residents to help eradicate the infestation and look to the streets of her Cadwell, New Jersey neighborhood to spray trees with a homemade bug spray. The police came home and spoke with Bobby and her mother, Monique Joseph. While they eventually left without incident, the family was still shaken. Bobby's older sister, Hayden Wilson, 13, called Lachey's actions extremely offensive, traumatic, and scarring for her family at a city council meeting. The viral video of Hayden's speech caught the attention of Joma Opera, an assistant professor of public health at Yale per NBC News. Opera invited the family for a campus tour and introduced them to a group of black female scientists who call themselves Bobby's Yale aunties. Je Joseph expressed gratitude for the support of her family, has received saying, quote, the whole community, the science community, got together and said, she's the one of us, we're not going to let her lose her steam for STEM. While we're going to support the family, we're going to support the girl, end quote. Although the groundhog recently predicted six more weeks of winter, the temperatures seem to be reflecting differently. Weather reporter Ashton Harder is here to give you your weekly weather update. Thanks, Devin. February may be in full swing, but the temperatures are reflecting that of spring instead. Thursday's temperature is going to break the previous record for highest temperature in February. Initially 68 degrees, the record-breaking temperature will be 69 degrees throughout the day. Expect some rain showers with an 88% chance of participation. Hold on to your hats because Pittsburgh will be under a wind advisory from 11 a.m. on Thursday to 7 a.m. on Friday morning with strong winds that could potentially be damaging. Now let's look at the rest of the week. This week, be prepared for a sudden drop in temperature. By the, by the time Friday rolls around, the that 69 degree temperature will drop to the high 40s. As the week goes on, temperatures will continue to be in the low 40s and go slowly rise up to the mid 50s by next Tuesday. On the bright side, the skies are expected to be clear for most su mostly sunny days. So enjoy the mild and beautiful week, Pittsburgh. Now back to the desk. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of News Night. If you want to see more, check out our social media pages on both Facebook and Instagram at UView Television. You can also check out more episodes on our YouTube channel or our website, uview.pointpark.edu. I'm Juliana Brock. And I'm Devin Ami. From everyone here at News Night, thank you for watching and have a great evening.